we are going to talk about the last part, um, the actual part where we finally get our functional protein in the process um, that's part of our central dogma. So we started off last week by looking at DNA replication. We then talked about how DNA can not only be replicated as a whole, but also be transcribed in pieces as needed to create functional products, a process called transcription. And when uh, you transcribe this, you transcribe a set of genes or just a single gene as needed for its functional value. That uh, process leads to uh, production of a copy, which is single-stranded RNA. And that RNA can then be the final working product in some cases, as we've seen in a tRNA or another microRNA, diamond sync RNA. Uh, but also, it can be incorporated as another part of a protein subunit, like you see in ribosome, to be part of a functional unit. Uh, but majority of our RNA that we transcribe are actually going to be translated into actual functional proteins. Um, so that's what we're going to be looking at today, is the process through which RNA gets translated into protein molecules. So just a, re a review of what we've done so far. We've talked about portions of DNA sequences that are your genes getting transcribed into RNA. The transcription is going to lead to a product that is complementary to one of the strands of the DNA since it's single-stranded RNA. Uh, and each cell type is going to produce its own specific set of RNA. So if I had hepatocyte culture in one plate and I had some neural culture in another, maybe some neuroblasts or some astrocytes growing in another plate, those two groups will have very different RNAs that are getting transcribed and translated at the end of the day. And I could look at that expression, gene expression, to identify what I am looking at without having other, any other information. The signals that dictate um, this process are through the signaling pathways that we've already kind of touched base on and we'll talk about a lot more later, where you have environmental cues that are received by the uh, actual proteins and actual receptors on the membrane of our cells. They then dictate what kind of genes are going to be upregulated, downregulated, and expressed. And these signals um, in the DNA, there are signaled actual sequences in the DNA, which will tell the polymerase, the RNA polymerase, where they should start transcription of a particular gene where they should stop transcription um, and all that good stuff. There are also regulatory regions within our genome that regulate when transcription will occur or uh, will be stopped. So the initiation of a bacterial gene transcription was simpler. It still required a sigma factor and some other proteins, but was still a very simple approach. However, in eukaryotic genes, the transcription is a complex process. It requires recognition of several initiator sequences, several proteins coming together in order to create a actual transcription complex that's going to allow for RNA polymerase to work correctly. So they require some general transcription factors as part of their uh, working machinery. Once the RNA is prepared, that's just your pre-mRNA It's not your final process molecule. It requires further processing in order to be fully uh, functional and messenger RNA. And all that processing is going to uh, take place in the nucleus in tandem with transcription. So as transcription is happening, it is also process other factors are coming in and actually processing that mRNA to uh, make those changes to create a possible, uh, uh, the full messenger mRNA. Now, what are some of those modifications that must occur? Can somebody tell me? So name one of them. To have a cap? Yes, so they have a methyl guanine cap at the beginning, and that's how it will know that that's the starting point of that messenger RNA. Yes, it needs the splicing 
so that you have all the actual messenger RNA there and all the intronic sequences removed. And then what's the third one? Just one more. The poly A tail. So it's not an acetylated tail, it's a poly A tail. It's just a bunch of U's, or uh, in this case, a bunch of A's that are put at the end of the transcript. The longer that tail, the longer those adenosine molecules are, uh, the more usually, the longer the half-life of that RNA. That is to stabilize that messenger RNA molecule and kind of dictate how long it's gonna hang around in the cytoplasm for translation reasons, okay? So in eukaryotes, the protein coding genes are usually interrupted by those non-coding sequences called intron, which must be spliced by SNRNPs. Um, and they are, uh, SNRNPs combined with other molecules create this spliceosome that splice out the introns and get together all the exons together. The RNA processing uh, takes place, like I said, within the nucleus as uh, in tandem with the transcription. So kind of like in a machinery, uh, if you can think about in a factory, you're just kind of passing along each step to the next molecule. And then your final mature eukaryotic messenger RNA is what's gonna get exported from the nucleus through the nuclear pore, where one set of molecules are gonna transfer it to the next set of molecules that are going to then translate. Um, now, all messenger RNA molecules are eventually going to be degraded in the cytosol. And when they get degraded, it's gonna be based upon the length of the poly A tail and needs of the cell overall for that particular messenger RNA to be there. Okay. So any questions still there before we talk about how it's now getting translated? Yes, no, maybe. No. Cool. So Remember, the messenger RNA is still composed of the same, you know, general four nucleotides, with the exception that instead of thymine, now you have uracil. So now you have J, C, A, and U, but it's just four letters. But these four letters have to code at the end of the day, 20 different amino acids, because that's all the amino acids that we need in the production of our proteins. Now, with the four nucleotides, you can think about, well, maybe each letter corresponds to a single uh, you know, amino acid. Well, if we do that, there's just not enough possibilities. Same thing if we say that you know, they're made up of two amino acid, two nucleotide sequences. Well, that only gives you 16 possibilities. That also does not work. But if you say that each amino acid is coded by a three letter word, you now have 64 possibilities. So you have more than enough options, different ways that it can be represented to give you the amount of, um, you know, different words, so to speak, that you need. And over time with experimentations, we have found that that is the case. And we'll talk about a little bit of that in a second. So it is indeed three letter words that code for each amino acids. And you will see that there are some similarities in the way these words are generated, right? And what codes for which amino acid. It actually gives it some additional properties that are important for its function and in its efficient use at the end of the day. Now, you don't need to know which codons as such code for which amino acid. The ones that I will expect you to know are methionine, so the start codon and the stop codon those you would need to know. So for methionine, there's only one amino acid that codes for that, and that's the AUG. That's your start codon. All proteins are starting with this AUG, the methionine to begin with. That's what's gonna get that five prime cap as well. And then you'll have three stop codons that we will talk about, okay? So here you should be able to. So while you do not need to know each amino acid uh, codes, like the words that relate to each amino acid code, you should be able to read a um, you know, box like this essentially and be able to 
answer questions given a code of mRNA and translate it into a protein code. So if I give you a box like this with some letters and tell you what they are coding for, so if I give you this exact chart, you should be able to translate a given mRNA. Okay? Yes? No? Maybe? Do you guys know how to read a chart like this or no? So what's the first letter, second letter? Yes, yeah. isn't it fun? <laughs> yes. So what you have, the first letter on this left side is your first letter of your codon. So each word in uh, um, this language is called a codon. So the first letter is the first position, right? So if you had the word the or end, E in end or T in the is the first letter. So the first thing you look at is this first letter. So that's the U in the stop column, C, A, and G. So it's a cross between making like a Punnett square and just kind of a puzzle, right? So this is going to be your first letter. The second letter is what's up here. Again, four options, U, C, A, and G. So you then put the second letter. So U, U, and then the third letter, there are four options in each square. So this top one is U, 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 or U, U, C, then U, U, A, U, U, G. So you get how you would read that? Yes, Taylor? Got it. Um, so, for example, if the first letter was C, all of those that are in the box for C, would you include all four of those? For what? I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not quite understanding how you would. So let me give you an example, okay? Please. Uh, for the kind of thing that I'm asking. Let's say that I give you a, you know, yes, I got you. So let's say, it's like looking at a battleship board with another axis on the right side. Think of it that way. That's true. Very true. Um, Okay, so let's say this is the sequence I give you, okay? So the first thing you wanna do is look for the start sequence. Start, uh, first thing you wanna do is divide it up into three letter words, right? Just to make it easy. And we'll talk about how you would figure that part out as well. Oh yeah, that makes sense. I get it now. You get it? So that's the yeah. first thing you want to do. Next, you want to look at this and say, okay, this is my sequence. Let me look for the start codon, right? So this is not AUG, this is not AUG, this is AUG. So that's your first letter, right? And that's going to code for a methionine, right? Then you look for UCC and you say, okay, UCC, there, it's serine, right? So that's how you would make your, oh, I wanted this one. I want the new one. Who's that? So methionine, serine, and then you go to the next one, CGA. And you say, okay, let's go to the C column. Let's go to the G and then look for A. That's arginine, right? And you write R. Oh, okay. Yeah, I get it. That's actually kind of cool. Yes. So that's how you would read it. And then when you finish, uh, you would know you've done because you would reach a stop codon. And there may be more things in front of it, but you would know that when you get to a stop codon, that's the end of your class. Cool? Yeah, cool. Okay, so now that we know how to read this drawing, you should be able to read this drawing. Um, and you may not have these as your letters, right? I may give you some, secret message for all I know. But you should be able to read a chart like this and relate it back to the same idea.
Okay, so what we have discovered is that I need to remove this first. Where am I going? Let's go back to the mouse. There you go. Uh, that the 64 codons that are possibilities are all used, but they are used for uh, specific amino acids. And that multiple codons, multiple words can mean the same thing, right? Multiple people can be named Susie. So same thing, multiple letters can mean serine and multiple letters can mean tyrosine. So, and then the only, you know, some are very specific, right? So there are, you'll notice, well, actually serine is coded by six different possibilities, but then there are others that are only coded by two. Methionine is only coded for by one. Tryptophan is another one that's only coded for by one. These are precious things. For some one reason or another, we'll talk about tryptophan being precious in bacterial cultures. Um, methionine is something that is very conserved. That's the only way that you're going to get a methionine is AUG. Say uh, for the stop codon, there are three different possibilities again. And it's the UAA, UAG, and the UGA. You should know these three and you should know AUG. Double stranded DNA portion asked to find the encoded coding sequence sometimes. It's, yes, and that is true. I can ask you to do the same as well. That is exactly what I'm going to ask you to do, Ryan, in the test. I may not make my strands as complicated as your biochem, but you will get the same. Yes. Okay. Okay, so the way they figured out which exact codon coded for what amino acid was by creating this cell-free free translation system where they provided everything in a test tube, all the things they needed to create those bonds and to make a chain of amino acids. And then they introduced synthetic mRNA sequences in there where they were just one codon specifically repeated again and again and again, whether it was a string of U's or it was a USC, USC, USC repeated again, or AUG repeated again and again. And they looked for what they got at the end of the day as their polypeptide chain. Um, and they made these radioactive polypeptide chains actually initially. Um, and these, in this case, the very first one that it was just a simple strand of U's and they got phenylalanine all over um, in a row. Uh, so that's how they could tell which amino acid coded for, uh, was coded for by each of those codons. And in the process, what they discovered is that an mRNA, actual RNA molecule can actually be translated in three possible reading frames. If there are no actual cell boundaries around one, and if there are no controls and checks in place like there are in a real life, right? So given a particular sequence of RNA, right? So if you give it CUC, AGC, G, you know, this particular, the strain, same strand, it could start translation at the first amino, uh, the very first nucleotide of the sequence at C, and you would get leucine, serine, valine, and threonine. Well, but it could also skip that first nucleotide and start on you. So without that AUG there in place to guide you where the codons are starting, what's the start sequence, you could actually get it like this. If you get, uh, if you shift it, you get very different amino acids. Now you got serine, alanine, leucine, and proline. So again, very different product at the end of the day. It could also skip two and start at number three. And again, that's going to shift it completely. So you are going to get very different sequences. So each mRNA molecule can be translated in three possible reading frames, but it isn't. It's controlled by the way those mRNAs are processed and kept intact so that they can only be translated from that AUG starting material. And that's what controls the rest of that protein chain. If it wasn't there and it wasn't the constant, you could have a situation just like this occurring in real life that would lead to obviously a lot of disasters. Now, how this is translated is with the help of the transfer RNA molecules. The tRNA molecules, uh, the sets of an actual active molecule, 
that's just made of RNA, just like the ones they talk about in the book as well. This matches the amino acid to the codons in the mRNA, the actual messenger RNA. And this particular transfer RNA molecule is going to, each one of them is going to take, is going to be holding on to a single amino acid that it codes for. So in this end, on their three prime ends, so if you look at that RNA molecule, you'll see that it's a 3D structure at the end of the day. If you put it laid out flat, it kind of looks like a clover leaf. So it has areas that have those double bonds happening because of the hydrogen bonding um, between those uh, sequences that are present inside it. And it has these loops that are forming on the edges, right? The loop at the straight end of the end of this clover leaf is what contains the anti-codon. And it is a single stranded portion, right? This has no bond between it, no hydrogen bonding happening. So it is free to form a bond with its complementary sequence within the mRNA chain, okay? Similarly, on the three prime end of this molecule, you also have a overhang, which is single stranded. And that overhang is where the attached amino acid will be. And this amino acid will be what uh, this codon codes for, right? So this anti-codon is the complementary sequence to the codon sequence. And this, and uh, you know, so what would be the, by the way, when I say that, what would be the codon for this particular uh, tRNA? CUU. So it's gonna be CUU, exactly. So this, for the CUU codon, this is the anti-codon that's allowing it to bind to that codon. And then on the opposite end, at the three prime end is the amino acid that it codes for, which is phenylalanine. So that is gonna be bound to that uh, three prime end and that's what's gonna bring it in to make that connection, okay? Now in real life, obviously these molecules are not going to be lying flat. They're going to be working and doing things. So when you look at, these are just two different views of this molecule in their 3D shape inside the way they would normally be found inside uh, our bodies. And they could have the amino acid tucked in when they are um, just moving around and when they are bound to their actual anti, you know, codon uh, from their anti-codon uh, site, then that phenyl uh, phenylalanine, that amino acid is gonna be extended out to make the bond with the rest of the polypeptide chain. Now, typically you would just, yes. Well, because at this point, this doesn't really have, this is both, by the way, these are both just the mRNA, uh, not the mRNA, this is not the mRNA molecule. This doesn't have, it is going to be the correct orientation you'll see in just a second. These are both the same uh, tRNA sequences. This is just the same sequence laid out straight. Okay. So this is not, um, you know, this is still the anticodon right there. This is to show a couple other things. Uh, so typically what you will see is that in your diagrams in the book, it's going to be shown like this, the tRNA molecule where the three prime end is where the amino acid is bound. And then this is the active site, the anticodon portion. And the sequence of the anticodon is what is going to be shown in this space. Now, down below, you can see your, uh, the sequence of this tRNA. There are a couple of things that I want you to look for in here. One is obviously your three prime end that's gonna bind to the amino acid and the anticodon, which is shown in red. But then if you look at it closely, it has some different shapes in some places. Those two, this Ds and this little, uh, you know, Greek letter of some sort, which I don't know what it stands for. These are just specifying areas where the um, uracil is modified uracil. It's not the normal uracil that you see. Uh, and these are just modifi modified uracils that are incorporated into the sequence 
to maintain the structure the way we see it. So that's how you actually recognize the tRNA molecule is because some of the uracils are modified uracils and not the typical uracils you see in an uh, RNA model. Okay, so now going back to the degenerate, uh, to the genetic code and how each codon specifies for the amino acid, we actually find that there are only 31 tRNA transfer RNAs that recognize all 61 codons. That means that some of these tRNAs can do double duty or even triple duty. The reason for that is that the genetic code is a little bit flexible, it's degenerate. So the first two amino acids, um, or not amino acids, I'm sorry, the first two nucleotides have to be consistent. The first two nucleotides are the most important part of the word. The last letter, the last letter in the word, the last nucleotide is flexible. So in this case, when you look at alanine, it's always GC for the first two letters. But for the last letter, it is, can be A, C, G, or U. So as long as the tRNA is bound to those first two letters, the third one can be a little bit wobbly and it still makes do with it. And it's still recognizing. Um, and because of that, you can have just 31 tRNAs and they can essentially take care of all the amino acids that are present there. Also, for the stop codons, there are no transfer RNAs that recognize them. Because no transfer RNA recognize that sequence, nothing comes in to bind to that sequence. And that is the signal essentially for it to be dismantled and let go. Okay? So this, this uh, little idea is also called the model hypothesis because that last mismatch causes a little bit of a wobble, not a very snug fit. Okay, questions about uh, anything up till there? Hold on, hold on. Good? Yes, no, maybe. Okay. So now how do we get, first of all, we have to think about how those transfer RNAs get those amino acids. And then we're going to talk about how those transfer RNAs transfer those amino acids. So the first part is actually building an active uh, tRNA, right? To uh, activate, or we call it actually charge a tRNA, it must have that amino acid bound to it, right? Otherwise it's an uncharged tRNA. So right now in this state, it is what we call a uncharged tRNA. There are specific amino acyl tRNA synthetases that help the binding of specific amino acids to specific tRNAs. There is a different amino, amino acyl tRNA synthetase for each one of the amino acids. So for example, in this one, this is the tRNA for tryptophan. It will have a tryptophanyl RNA, a tRNA synthetase that will carry the tryptophan and bind it in a process that requires ATP hydrolysis, similar to what we've been seeing up till now, uh, to make a high energy bond and transfer it to the tRNA. This includes two phosphates molecules being used in this process, again. So you will notice all along the DNA uh, replication, transcription, anytime we've seen these processes form, anytime we've seen these bonds form, whether it is in the formation of DNA itself or RNA or the transcription process, it's always been two phosphates from the ATP getting used and an AMP molecule getting released, okay? Um, so this forms a really high energy bond that charges this amino, uh, this basically tRNA molecule at that time. Now, once this binds to the anticodon, inside uh, the actual mRNA molecule, then uh, this energy bond, high energy bond will be broken and get transferred to that polypeptide chain uh, that will cause this to become uncharged again and released. So here you can see that it is indeed, the actual binding is in the opposite direction, just like always. It's not gonna be the same direction. 
So it is going to be the three prime to the five prime end of the anticodon that's going to bind to the five prime to the three prime end of the codon. Okay. So it's going to read the same way that it should. The amino acid that comes in is going to be obviously controlled by the tRNA that binds to the codon through its base pairing with the anticodon. Now, once uh, all this happens inside a very specific factory called ribosomes. So let's look at the ribosome itself and see how its structure is built. The RNA message um, that is translated by the ribosomes is done in the cytosol. Whether it is through three ribosomes that are just hanging out all along the cytoplasm or through the bound, side, uh, bound ribosomes that are going to be along your endoplasmic reticulum, the rough ER. But either way, it's all outside. Nothing is happening inside the nucleus as far as translation is concerned. You will have some translation happening in the mitochondria, right, in chloroplasts because they have their own little process going on with their own little circular uh, DNA as well. But majority of your actual translation is happening in the cell. Now, there are two subunits of the ribosomes. It looks like this, where it's a large subunit and a small subunit. The large subunit is composed of approximately 49 different protein molecules, along with three rRNA molecules, two small and one large RNA uh, strand. And the small subunit is composed of 33 additional ribosomal proteins, along with the one rRNA. So in total, when you look at this molecule, it's humongous, right? It's over 4 million kilodaltons, you know, uh, daltons big. It's really high molecular weight. Um, and this is composed of approximately 80 plus proteins along with the four different RNA molecules. The RNA molecules are needed to create that catalytic site for the Rece reception of the tRNA molecule and its exit as well. So when we look at it closely, you are going to see, um, again, this is a ribbon model, and then you have the cartoon of it again. You have the large subunit and the small subunit on top of each other. Inside, there are three catalytic sites, three actual binding sites. They are mentioned called A site, it's the amino acid site, the peptidyl site, which is the P site, and the exit site or the E site. Each one of these will have some of those ribosomal chains incorporated into it to create that active structure. Um, in here, you see in this ribbon model that all three sites are bound. That's actually not true. At any given time, no more than two sites should be bound and one will be free, okay? So let's look at how exactly it will Form. So it forms, the ribosome is normally not formed, fully functional unit is not together uh, before it starts the translation process. Initially, the initiator tRNA, which is your methionine, and a translation initiation factor, it's usually more than one factor combined some. with this initiator tRNA, are bound to the small ribosomal subunit as a whole, that's how they will be found uh, in the free cytosol space. That system is going to come in and it is going to bind to the MR, just randomly. It's gonna bind at the five prime path and it will start just kind of scrolling along the initiator, uh, initiation factors kind of move it along that path until this methionine binds to the AUG. So the A, again, the AUG dictates the start of that mRNA sequence, uh, the actual translating portion of that mRNA sequence. So it's just gonna kind of keep going, keep going, keep going until it finds an AUG that it will bind to. I heard some noise, was there a question? Yes, no. No, sorry, like I was switching devices and ah. like feedback happened. Okay, no problem. Um, yes, Taylor. I don't know if you already said this, um, but the portion before the AUG coding sequence, 
um, what happens to that? Does it stay? Does it fall off? Well, the sequence is going to be there in the mRNA. It's also part of its regulatory sequence, uh, regulatory region, and kind of controls not only how much of it is going to be translated and when it's going to be translated. It's a five prime untranslated region. There's okay. also sometimes going to be an three prime untranslated region in addition to the poly -A -A. Um, This is part of the mRNA. It's going to be there. But it's not going to be part of the protein because, look, no amino acid is getting linked in this region, right? Yeah, because okay. the theonine hasn't bound to its starting codon. Yeah. So it's not until this initiator uh, tRNA binds and binds to an AU chain that an actual polypeptide chain can start to happen. Okay. And right now, only the small ribosomal subunit is there, not the top portion, which will. In recruit the TR. Okay? okay? Yeah, okay, thank you. Yeah, so it's gonna kind of walk along the mRNA until it finds the AUG or the start codon. When it finds that codon, it's going to make that bond, right? That's when it's going to bind to its anticodon, the anticodon in the methionine. Initiated tRNA will, uh, you know, have its hydrogen bonding with the codon sequence and it will stall it. That stalling then causes the translation initiation factor to dissociate, allowing the large subunit to come bind to it. Until, until the initiation factor dissociates, this can't bind, right? So then the large subunit comes on top of it and creates the actual functional unit. Now, when it binds, you notice that the AUG is actually sitting in the peptidyl site. That's the only tRNA that's going to start at the peptidyl site. Otherwise, every charged tRNA that comes in is gonna come in at the amino acyl site. And then once the bond has been made between the two amino acids, the one from before, the polypeptide chain from before and the new amino acid, then the peptidyl amino acid will move to the exit site and the acyl amino acid will move to the peptidyl site for that peptide bond uh, to be transferred, okay? Yes? So step one, you know, before step one is the initiation of the translation, the methionine comes in with the small ribosomal uh, subunit and the translation initiation factors. It scans the mRNA until it binds to the AUG that causes the translation initiation factors to dissociate and the large sub, uh, ribosomal subunit to bind. The next charge uh, tRNA will then bind to the A site. That's step one of the process, is that it's going to, the charged tRNA will bind to its anti, to its anticodon, to the codon sequence and get recruited into the A site, amino acyl site. The first peptide bond is forming here that's your step two. Then in step three, the large subunit translocates in the process, moving the amino acyl um, subunit to the peptidyl site and the one that's now free because it's already made the chain and the amino acid is ripped off will end up in the exit site. And then in the step four, the small subunit will translocate to throw out the free tRNA, the uncharged tRNA. That will then get charged again and then be part of the process. So in each step, it's kind of, you know, the top moves and then the bottom moves and the top moves and the bottom moves, right? So in step one, you have binding of the new uh, charged tRNA. In step two, you have the peptide bond forming. In step three, the large subunit moves one site over to move the now bound, uh, you know, a charged tRNA that with the polypeptide chain over to the peptidyl site. And then in step four, the small subunit translocates to move the, uh, to eject the tRNA out, okay? Yes? Yes, no, maybe. 
Okay. Uh, somebody has a question in the chat. Oh, I didn't see. Let's see. I don't see this question. So the chair, am I line up? That no, they do not line up in the same direction. They line up in the opposite way, just like everything else. So that was what I was showing you. Oh no, he accidentally sent it to me. He said, "I missed this, but what do A, P, and E sites stand for?" I know oh, what they so, do, but I forget what their names are. Yes, so the uh, A site is what we call the amino acyl site. So that's when the charged DRNA binds with its polypep, you know, with the amino acid on there, and it is not yet bound to the polypeptide chain. Once the polypeptide chain is linked to this amino acid, then it can move to the P site, which is what we call the peptidyl site. That's the site that makes the peptide bonds. And then once the polypeptide chain has all the amino acids, and now this tRNA does not contain any, it's uncharged, right? It doesn't contain any amino acid itself. It's going to shift to the E site, which is the exit site. And that's where it will then get ejected. OK? Yeah, I didn't see that message. So thank you for reading it, Jim. OK, so the ribosome itself is a ribosome. It is uh, because it has its own catalytic activity. It has 23 sRNA molecule uh, in the large subunit, which is part of the peptidyl transferase. So it's at that peptidyl, that's you know the peptidyl site, the P site, there is that ribosomal portion that is going to be helpful in creating that peptide bond. Um, the rRNAs, all the four, remember the four rRNA molecules in there, they are responsible not only for the peptide uh, bond transfer in the you know, step, but also for generally overall structure of the rice, keeping it intact and keeping the binding sites intact. So one of the rRNA is ribosomal RNA is this large 23S unit, right? And then the others are these L1 and the 5S, and then there's another one in the back. So this 5S, you know, these are combining together to create a structure that is um, kind of providing scaffolding in a way for the polypeptide chains as well to get around and snugly fit in this system. Um, so now let's see what happens when you get to a UAG or a stop codon. When you get to a stop codon, um, it comes and now there's no tRNA to bind to it. So instead, there's another factor that is called the release factor. It's kind of like a block that comes and binds to the UAG codon. When that happens, it just nothing is going to get transferred from this block, it doesn't carry any amino acids. It will just get shifted over uh, like other uh, transfer RNAs were, and it will end in release of that uh, polypeptide chain, which again does require, again, another catalytic activity to terminate uh, and release that polypeptide chain and give it that carboxy end, okay? So the release factor binds to the stop codon during translation, causing the ribosome to dissociate, and then it will just open up. There is a little video in here that was in earlier. Let's see if it plays now. So you see here how the ribosomal subunit is going to get bound, right? You have the different tRNAs that are part of it. This is in bacteria, so obviously the proteins are going to be a little bit different. But you saw how the small subunit was the one that bound to it. And then once it found the methionine, then it bound the methionine, then the large subunit came up. The initiator factor fell off, and now it's going to elongate the polypeptide chain. So you will see each time a tRNA come bind to its um, anti to its anti codon to the codon sequence, and it's going to once it binds, it's going to then interact with the polypeptide chain, and then 
it will shift as the next tRNA will then come through. So there are other proteins that are helping to bring in the right transfer RNAs to the system. And that's what you see with the other factors that are elongation factors that are coming in. They are not only providing energy for the move of those systems, but also for recruiting the correct tRNA to the site to extend the polypeptide chain. And each time you see kind of, you know, it's kind of like a chaperone, right? It's saying, hey, come on, you come back, you come back. So it's monitoring them as they come along and you have the polypeptide chain forming on the backside still attached to the large subunit until it reaches the stop codon. And at that time, you have a release factor that will then really, you know, bind to the stop codon and release the polypeptide chain and dissociate this process altogether. So the ribosomal units dissociate again. So again, uh, if you remember from last uh, class, we talked about how a single mRNA molecule can be, uh, can have multiple ribosomes on it all along its chain uh, at different stages of translation. Same thing as transcription. Remember, it was transcribing multiple strands at the same time, same thing here. It's not waiting for one molecule to finish for another to start. They're efficient, they keep moving and multiple ribosomes are going to be on the same mRNA molecule translating it at the same time. Depending on the needs of the protein, of the cell, there may be just a couple of them or there may be a lot of them, hundreds of them. Uh, and also the size of the mRNA, obviously. And that's what you show here. And that's what you see in here inside the cell as well. Now in prokaryotes, a single mRNA molecule can actually contain multiple start sites. Many times these are genes that are part of the same metabolic pathway um, and are same, you know, uh, general pathway, and, but they are different proteins in each case. And they will all be kind of strung together on the same large mRNA molecule. So ribosomes can bind to all of these AUGs and make those three polypeptides all at the same time. Um, in these cases. And this is an example of that, that a single mRNA molecule has multiple polypeptide chains, uh, sequences from multiple polypeptides. In bacteria, a lot of the antibiotics that we work with actually work by preventing this protein synthesis process. So many of these most common uh, antibiotics that we look at, so tetracycline, streptomycin, uh, cyclohexamide, all of these, rapamycin, all of these are part of either binding to amino acid or tRNA to stop it from binding to begin with and to ever make more protein or uh, from transferring the amino acid to prevent elongation of polypeptide chains. So um, are from actually translocating uh, inside once it has the polypeptide chain. So it basically binds to several processes within that translation machinery. Rifamycin is one drug that is different than all these others in that it actually binds, it inhibits transcription. So ever mRNA ever getting made. The rest of these, the mRNA are still getting made, but then they're not being able to translate into actual protein molecules, which inhibits the cells. Now, some of these proteins are going to uh, be immediately polyubiquitinated by, um, and this would be something that's part of the sequence, um, so that they are going to be degraded by the proteasome as soon as they are built. Uh, so any protein that is marked by a polyubiquitin chain, a long chain of ubiquitin, um, is degraded by the proteasome, which is another large complex of proteins that comes together to uh, form this kind of like barrel-like structure 
the protein goes, binds to it through the ubiquitination, this long polyubiquitin chain. And then it is taken in to that barrel space and broken down into small pieces where then it can, is released in these small kind of, you know, 10 um, amino acid sequences or so. And then they're broken down further by the other proteases uh, into individual amino acids that can then be recycled or destroyed. Uh, so that's one of the things that happens. Now, why would a cell go through the entire process of making a protein if it's gonna kill it right afterwards, degrade it right afterwards? Ooh, we're over time. You guys didn't tell me. I should have a timer on there. But I'm gonna stop here. Uh, we just have a couple more slides. We'll finish them up next time. But answer the question at least, uh, why would a protein get made if it's just gonna be destroyed? Actually, usually it's not that at all. Um, if it was an error that was made, that's something that can happen, yes, but that's a minority. Majority of the time, it's a protein that is needed for uh, our body or our cells to respond to a, situ a specific situation, a particular type of stress, maybe heat shock protein, for example, or a protein that marks, us for apop marks the cell for apoptosis because of some major damage that has happened. These are proteins that are made constantly, but then they are degraded if they are not needed immediately. If they are needed, then there are specific signals, environmental cues that are received by the cell that stabilize them, that keeps them there so they can do their job. Otherwise, they're just made and destroyed in the process. Can you have gene expression and production of an actual function protein in a eukaryotic cell? It's not a simple thing, right? It requires multiple levels of regulation. You have these promoter sequences within the actual genome um, that are flanked by other regulatory regions as well that may be modified or regulated through post-transcriptional uh, post modifications. Um, these promoter sequences control when a particular gene is gonna be transcribed. Um, and then within the gene sequence itself, you're going to have several introns and exons that can be alternatively spliced at times, right? to make different versions, different flavors of the same protein maybe, as we talked about certain muscle proteins being slightly modified for different parts of the body. Once you get your pre-mRNA mate, then it is modified again to include the um, guanine cap at the methyl end, at the five prime end. And then um, through the elongation and slicing of your introns, you have your final, um, messenger RNA. In addition, it's also going to contain a poly A tail that's going to stabilize it and control how long it's going to hang out in the cytosol. Now, some of these mRNA are going to be degraded right away if they are not needed for translation. Again, because of the same reasons we just talked about. Others, once they're exported, that is out of the nucleus through the nuclear pore, others are going to then initiate translation. Others will go to translation. In translation, you have, again, the small subunit coming in with the initiation factor, carrying the methionine. It scans the mRNA until it finds the start codon, where then the ribosomal large subunit can come bind to it. The initiation factor falls off. The protein uh, is then made in a long polypeptide chain until it reaches the stop codon and it's released. This protein is then folded and modified further in post-translational modifications, such as phosphorylations and glycosylations to make a pool of functional protein that will do work. If that protein is not needed, it will, can get ubiquitinated and destroyed as well at this point. Um, so this is again an example of how the newly synthesized polypeptide chain is getting folded through hydrogen bonding on its own, as well as through the help of cofactors that are binding to form further um, modifications to it, right? Some of these uh, cofactors are necessary for the protein to function properly. 
same here with some of these modifications that are usually covalent modifications. So a lot of the uh, cofactors that are bound are just going to be part of the weights folded and are not going to be through non-covalent interaction. But the modifications that are found uh, on top of that, the translation or post-translational modifications are covalent modifications. So the phosphorylation, the methylation, the phthalations, glycosylations, all those things are going to be post-translational covalent modifications of your proteins. And that will then give you the fully functional, again, um, form a final protein product. That final protein can then form further non-covalent bindings with other protein subunits, as you see in the ribosome, with over 80 proteins coming together to form that functional unit. So this just provides you with a review of how we go from RNA to protein with the mRNA sequence decoded in sets of three nucleotides. So the words are made of, there are three letter words all across the mRNA molecule. Uh, the tRNA molecules that match the amino acids to codons in mRNA have their own anti-codon sequence that binds to that, that makes that hydrogen bonding to the codon sequence. Um, the, the specific enzymes that help couple these tRNAs to the correct amino acid right, the amino acid um, synthesizes. Then the mRNA messages are decoded on ribosomes with the help of the RNA and the tRNA uh, ribosome acting as a ribozyme, uh, forming those polypeptide chains. The specific codons in the mRNA sequence uh, signal the ribosome where to start and stop protein sequences. Um, so the AUG, is always going to bind to that first initiator of the kaolin and signal the start of the polypeptide chain. And then your stop codons, one of the three, is going to signal the stop part of the protein synthesis. And these proteins uh, don't have to be produced one at a time. They are many times produced as uh, multiple chains happening through poly ribosomes. So multiple ribosomes binding all along the mRNA. And then you can have inhibitors of these, both in eukaryote and the prokaryotic system, but specifically in prokaryotic system, inhibitors of protein synthesis are used as antibiotics for infection. And um, finally, you can have a very controlled uh, protein breakdown to help regulate how much of each protein is present at any given time and when it is expressed, um, when it is used for actual function versus just prepared as emergency use. Um, so that is the last. Now, this is coming back to that life chapter that we read in the book Genome, uh, where we talked about how RNA may be that precursor molecule, life molecule that it all started with. Because RNA molecule can itself guide the formation of an exact copy of itself and create a complementary RNA as well. So you can have your original RNA sequence that can serve as a template to produce a complementary RNA. That complementary RNA can then serve as a template to produce the original sequence. So it's a little bit of a complicated molecule, right? Complicated uh, two-step system versus a single step, but it works. It can do it. So in the in, there is a thought that RNA is predating DNA and protein in the evolution of life. Um, and that's the RNA world hypothesis. There is a link to a cool lecture from Khan Academy over here. And it talks about how RNA-based systems would have worked just by themselves as RNA single molecules that can replicate themselves, that can do the catalytic activity they need to do and just continue on. And then over time, RNA would have, um, developed to create this protein-based system so that RNA was used as your copy, the information to translate into protein that then did the work. And then eventually, because RNA is not a very stable molecule, uh, DNA over time through mutation or something got devised so that now it took over as a genetic material because it was such a stable molecule. And now RNA became an intermediary rather than the main source of information between the DNA and the protein. Okay, so hope you guys liked today's lecture. 
I definitely, this is one of the topics that I need to work the most in biological science. And that's all. Next week, we'll go on a new topic and learn more about sickness. Take care. Bye-bye.